We've talked about single oscillators. Now we are going to talk about coupled oscillators. But first, let's be clear what that means. So here are two pendula, pendula, pendulums, pendulums. I'll send you a link later about that. So here are two pendulums, and individually they're each an oscillator. As we've discussed, gravity pulls them back. It makes a nice linear restoring force for small perturbations. This one can oscillate, and this one can oscillate, and they can oscillate however they want. But now I'm going to take this weak spring, and I'm going to connect it to each one. And now they're coupled. So now they're coupled in the sense that the position of one affects the force on the other. So this one feels just a normal spring force, but look what happens here. If I move this one, that one moved a little bit. You had a little force on the right one when I moved the left one, and that is the sense in which they're coupled. So it's nice and still, and there it goes. And the same thing will happen over here. The spring has them coupled. If I move this one, we'll see this one move just a little bit. There you go. So the spring has them now physically coupled. Let's look mathematically. So to think about it mathematically, we better draw it a little bit first. So here we have pendulum, we'll call the left one pendulum A, and here we have, we'll call the right one pendulum B. They're separated by a distance that we'll call big D, and we've added a spring with spring constant, say, K. Now let's see, so what we want to do is have an axis. Let's put them on the x-axis, and we'll say A is resting at the origin at x equals zero, and B would therefore be resting at position x equals d. That's how we could set it up. Let's go ahead and write our definition of coupled oscillators when the position of one one affects the force on the other. So we've now seen it physically, and we're about to get there mathematically. So how do we want to treat these two oscillators? Well, we want to apply the laws of motion. So we need to also give them their own um, uh, uh, variable to, to describe their position. So we'll call this one xA and this one xB. xA rests at 0, xB rests at x equals d. So to figure out how they move, we just apply Newton's second law. They still obey Newton's second law. Just because they're coupled doesn't mean that doesn't apply. So we say the sum of the forces on A equals the mass times the acceleration of A, x double dot A. They both have the same mass also. I didn't say that. There you go. Same mass. All right, so let's see if we can figure out what are all the forces on A. Well, one force on A is just the pendulum force, sort of the restoring force you get from the small um, um, motion of a pendulum. It's minus m g over L times the position of A. So if you work out the equation of motion for a pendulum, that's kind of like the force pulling the pendulum back. Now, A is also touching the spring, and we know from Hooke's law that the force it feels, it's always pulling it back. If it moves to positive um, x, it pushes it negative x. If it moves to negative x, it pulls it in positive x. Most of what you're seeing here is due to the pendulum motion, but the spring also pushes and pulls that way. We would write that minus k times xA. That would be the spring force. But we know it's more complicated. We showed it's more complicated. It also depends on the back of the spring. What that means is it depends on the position of B. And it's not even a standard Hooke's Law spring force. If you think about it in terms of the position of B, so here we have A, we're thinking about A. What if we move B, have it have a deflection forward, positive? What is the spring going to do? It pushes it forward. And if we have B move in the negative direction, that's what it's going to do to A, it lets it go negative. So it's sort of the opposite of Hooke's Law. And the reason is we're pushing on the back of the spring. The Hooke's Law, you know, F equals minus KX is because you're pushing on the front of the spring. If you move the back of the spring, on something, it does sort of the opposite of Hooke's Law. So what we know is then it's going to be uh, the opposite's going to happen. It's going to be plus 
kx, essentially. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a minus k here and have this in parentheses. And since there's a negative here, it'll be negative. Right? So negative times negative is positive. So it'd be uh, x, uh, depend on the position of xb. But then there's another complication is xb is always defined by deflections around d. So it's actually xb minus d. So that's all the negative signs and parentheses you have to keep up with. It's minus k times xa, and essentially plus k times xb. But xb is always relative to d. Another way you can think about this force, if you're thinking about the force on an object where both the front and the back change, it's really minus k times the difference in the length of the spring. Right? This is the front minus the back. That's like the, the length of the spring. So that's really what we're capturing here. That's why I wrote it this way, minus k times xa minus xb, the front minus the back. So you can think of it in terms of individual forces or the front minus the back. However you want to think about it is fine. But just to have pretty notes, we'll remember that this is the pendulum force and this is the spring front and this is the spring back. All right. So there's Newton's second law for the sum of the forces and those equal m x a double dot. And that is the equation of motion for xa. So most of it looks like something we could solve. Sinusoidal solution because we have some something times a equals m times the second derivative of the position of a. But this b is here. And that b is not a constant. That b can change, as we've seen. That complicates things. Real quick, quick, let's write the equation of motion for b. We won't go into as much detail, but it's basically minus m g over l times xb, but we have to remember it's xb minus d. Right? It's the deviations from the position d that give you the restoring force due to the pendulum motion. So whenever you see xb, it's always going to be xb minus big D. Um, minus k and the front, xb minus d minus the back, xa equals m xb double dot. There's the other equation of motion. So these are the coupled equations of motion, EOM as we call them. And now we just have to figure out how to solve them. How do we deal with the fact that these two equations of motion look like something we've dealt with, except they're coupled. They have terms in each other's equations. We'll do that next.